So, well, it's great to see you. We're in the book of Colossians this morning, Colossians chapter 3. And the title is When Christ is First in Our Lives, Part 2. Uh, part 1 was last week. And, um, I want to give just a, a caveat. There are multiple lists in this uh, passage, so if you would give me the grace of hanging with me just a touch longer than I typically preach, um, well, uh, a little bit longer. I won't, I won't say a touch longer, because, um, uh, but I'm going to try and uh, keep it as tight as we can, uh, but we will end on time by God's grace, and we'll uh, get out to the summer of fun. But um, how many of you uh, do spring cleaning? Anybody do spring cleaning at your house, right? The, the weather uh, gets, uh, gets uh, a little bit warm, and uh, all of a sudden it's like newness and freshness, and, and, and you want to be out with the old and in with the new. I don't know if it's like uh, your house like it is at ours, but uh, when there's the uh, first sense of any warmth, we open like every window in the house. It's like all that dead air from winter. Just get on out, and we want some new, fresh stuff in. Or maybe some of you change some of your decor. You're like, man, I got bored over the winter staring at all this stuff. I need some new, fresh stuff. So out with the old, in with the new. Um, today is kind of like a spring cleaning for the heart. As we look in the uh, passage from uh, Colossians chapter 3, it's a spring cleaning uh, for your heart to be out with the old and in with the new. And uh, it's more than a yearly thing, though, when it comes to the heart, right? And it's more than even a weekly thing. This is a day-by-day, even moment-by-moment uh, cleaning that comes uh, from Jesus. And that's what we're going to see as we uh, look in God's Word. So if you have your copy, start with me in uh, verse 5 of chapter 3, and we're going to uh, go through uh, just the first points uh, passage this morning. So verse 5, the Apostle Paul says this, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. If you're taking notes, and we always encourage you to take notes, you're going to have to take some feverish notes this morning, but start with this point. Off with the old. Off with the old. Can we all say that by faith? Off with the old. Well done. Uh, when Christ is first in our lives, we're putting off the old life. We're putting off the old ways. And Paul actually calls the Colossians to that, and the Word of God would call us to that as well in three different places. Starting in verse 9, he says this, Do not lie, uh, lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And put off the old self is also in Greek, the old man or the old woman, the old person you were before Jesus in the gospel, you were covered in sin. You had this sin nature that you inherited from your great, great, great grandfather Adam and, and it was passed on to you, but also you participated in that with your very own sin. And we are covered with this. And this morning I'm going to use different colored jackets to kind of represent this. And our lives before Jesus were as if we were cloaked and we were covered and we were completely dark on the inside. We were completely black before we knew Jesus, right? Because of the sin that had corrupted our lives, the sin that had stained our souls, and we had been corrupted before God, and we were not worthy of his righteousness, but then we saw Jesus. We saw the cross and the work that Jesus did on the cross on behalf of our sins, yours and mine, and we opened our eyes, or God opened our eyes, really, to see the glories of what Jesus did on the cross to pay for our sin, offer us for forgiveness and give us new life. And what Paul is saying here is that when you came to know Christ, your old life died. That old way of living, that old person, that person of sin within you, it actually died, right? And you took off that old self. You put it away and you put off that old man, that old woman, that old sin uh, self in Christ. And he says, um, you've put off the old self, right? But it's also putting off the old ways. Paul's like, now that you've found Christ and put that old man or that old woman uh, back, we have to put off the ways. Because sometimes while we're not, uh, we are no longer uh, black and dark on the inside, but we've been given the righteousness of Christ through the gospel, now sometimes we go back to it. We hold this old life or we put some of this old life on us and we cover ourselves again with the, the sinful flesh or the sinful activities. And many of those are listed here. And Paul's like, you got to put those off. 
In fact, in verse 8, he says, but now you must put them all away. Almost as you'd take off the garment and you'd put it away out of your sight, out of your life, and not use it anymore. Not even storing it in the attic, not even just giving it away to goodwill. You're just throwing it away completely. In fact, he goes, we got to get violent with this old life and these old ways. And he goes in verse 5, he says, put it to death. Really, you gotta cur- you got to kill it. you got to murder it. When the sinful life comes back, that life of your old life before Christ, or that way of the world and sinning against the things of God and going against his ways, when that comes up, man, you got to get violent with it in Jesus' name and overcome those things and put it to death. Murder it in Jesus' name. Kill that old way of living. Kill that sin. Don't go back to those old ways. And what are some of those old ways? Notice he lists these out. He says sexual immorality. In Greek, it's the word pornea, from which we get our word pornography. But this would encompass not just pornography, but all forms of sexual sin. Now, God gave us sex as a blessing. It is a blessing for a husband and a wife in the marital context to enjoy together, to experience the blessing of of that, that relationship and the sexual relationship in marriage, and also to experience the blessing of children that come as a result of it. But in the other ways that, that our sin perverts and our sin that turns away or adds to our sexual freedom, so to speak, the Bible says, no, 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 those ways that Scripture has called you to. They say don't sin and don't go towards those ways because they're not good and they're hurtful to yourself and your family and your community. So sexual immorality, all forms of sexual sin, put that old way to death. Put those old ways out of your life. He says also impurity, and this would be a general term for all types of moral corruption. Where maybe it's lacking integrity and the deceitfulness or the lies that go on behind the scenes or Maybe it's a dissension that's being stirred up and the desire to just upset the apple cart and we're going to break the unity of the community, so to speak. Or maybe it's just an idolatry and going after things that aren't uh, of the Lord. That's impurity. He also uses the phrase passion. Now for the Greeks, this word passion was pathos, right? And pathos, they loved pathos. In fact, it was the supreme virtue in the Greek culture, right? And for the Greeks, they would ask the question at funerals so often, did he have passion? Did she have passion? In the way they lived their lives, in the knowledge and the way they educated themselves, or the way they participated in sports or in their job, did they show passion? passion. And the Apostle Paul is is saying, wait a minute, passion can be good in some context, but when it leads you away from the things of Christ, that passion that leads you to things that are sinful or leads you away from Jesus being your preeminent and your supreme affection in this life, he's like, man, you got to get rid of that passion that is evil or that negative passion leading you astray and away from Jesus. He also says evil desires, which would be just a general term for wickedness and hungering for wickedness or longing for things that are, are, are wicked or the Bible would say are, are unhealthy, ungood, and unholy for your life. He says and goes on and says covetousness as well, which is idolatry. That's desiring or pursuing something that God has given to your neighbor and not to you, right? Right? And how, my, how many of us struggle with like keeping up with the Joneses, right? And the Joneses just got a new car, and I like their new car, and my car looks kind of old and, sh- and shabby, and I want a new car, and I want their car, right? Or my new neighbor got a brand new wife, and she's right, she's great, she looks so much better than my wife, and my eyes are going on the wrong way, and, and, and God's like, no, 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 keep your heart and your eyes on what I've given you. When we look to other things, that's covetousness, and ultimately the Bible calls covetousness idolatry, right? Because we're looking at that thing and longing for that thing, but our hearts lift it up in such a way that we give worship to it. We don't even think we're worshiping or bowing down to it, but our hearts are going, man, if I don't have that, I'm not going to be complete. I'm not going to be enough. I'm gonna, not, my reputation's going to be less than them. And so we lift this thing up and we exalt this thing and we run after that thing. And Jesus is like, no, 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 that's going to kill you. That's your old life, your old ways. Put that off. Put it to death and put it away, he says. And then in verse 6, he gives a little warning. He says, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming, right? 
And if you've read the whole Bible, especially if you've gotten to the end, you know that there's a day when, when Jesus is coming back, right? And this first time he came to do the work on the cross and to show a sinful, sinless life and to uh, raise again from the dead on, uh, on Easter Sunday, triumphing over sin and death and, 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 and the devil and overcoming all of that and providing for us a salvation we could never purchase in ourselves. And yet, after that day, there is another time coming in the future when Jesus is coming back. And he is coming to bring wrath against sin. All that sin that has been against him and against his ways and against the good that he so longs for humanity. But those who have rejected him, he's bringing his wrath. And Paul's like, remember, followers of Jesus, those of you who have trusted in the gospel... You are no longer members who would be under the wrath of God. You are no longer people, or as the Bible would say, children of wrath, but rather you are children of the light. You are children of Jesus. You've been transferred to the kingdom of light, and you are a citizen of heaven, and that wrath is not upon you. So don't go back to those things for which wrath is actually coming. And it's a warning. But then he goes on. In these you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. He says, anger and wrath, put those things away, right? And so many of us can, uh, can very easily identify with anger. Everybody feels that emotion, and uh, it's, it's some for, for some of us, it's that inner seething that we feel, right? It's that inner sense that just rises up and says, that was unjust, or I didn't like that, or you're not treating me the way I think I should be treated, or, or you hurt me, right? And, and, and it rises up, and we feel that. We know it. Some of us, really, in this room, if we were honest before our brothers and sisters, man, we would say, that is hurts and that overtakes my life and I have brought a world of hurt on my family or on my friends or on people in my life. I've distanced people from my life because I have an anger problem and it just wells up and overtakes sometimes. And sometimes it even gets to the point of wrath, which is very akin to anger, and yet this is the inner seething that comes out when we give full vent to our anger. And scripture says that it's only the fool who does that, right? to give full vent to the anger. It's like anger is like this beast inside, right? It's this animal inside that's like, rah, rah, and I gotta get out, and it wants to break through the doors, and it starts to break through. Well, wrath gives full vent to that anger. It says, come on out, right? Come on out, beast, have your way, and it opens the doors, full vent, and it lets out all of the fire, all of the fury, and it lets the beast out, right? And that beast usually comes out and brings a world of hurt, whether verbally or physically or psychologically, and it is painful to experience. And the Bible says, that, that's not you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that is no longer you. Don't let those ways back into your life. Rather, put them to death. Rather, put away that old life. He goes on and he talks about malice. This is when you have wicked intent towards your neighbor or wicked actions towards another. When you seek to do others evil rather than to do them good. Malice. And he says also slander. Uh, again, similar concepts, but this is one that focuses on the verbal attacks, the spoken attacks to denigrate or defame the character or the reputation of another. And so many times it comes from my own insecurities, right? I want to be you know, valued like them. And so I feel like if the only way I can be valued is by bringing them down. And so we attack someone else or we speak against their character or we stir up. Or maybe it is a covetous heart and I want what they have. I want the position and the power or the influence that they have or I just want the adoration that they have. And so we tear them down behind the scenes or we speak ill to tear them down in the eyes of others. Slander. And God would say, man, that's, that's your old life. That is the old woman, the old man coming back. And put that away. Don't give way to those ways. You must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. It's interesting with this obscene talk. Um, because it's speech that is culturally obscene, distasteful, and offends. 
Now, some of us have a hard time with that, that definition or understanding it, that it's culturally obscene, distasteful, and, and, and offense. Like, I have a, a, a friend um, who, is, uh, who is British, you know? He's, uh, he's from England, and he has some words in his vernacular that are different than mine, and those are obscene words. And if he was to ever say them to me, I'd be like, what's the big deal, right? Or sometimes I use words that are obscene in, in, in his culture, and I don't even know it, but I'm offending him with those obscene words without even knowing. I, there was a sister in our uh, body this morning who at first service, and she's from New Zealand, and she's like, oh my goodness, I see it in the names of businesses around here, and it's on the sign, and I'm like, how can you use that word here? And she's like, oh yeah, I'm in America, right? Got to remember where I am. And some of us are black and white, right? Some of you are black and white. You don't have to admit whether you're a black and white person, but you're like, yeah, there's either right or there's wrong, and never the twain shall meet, and there's nothing else different, and you have so much difficulty with the grace, right? And it's hard for you even here, and how can this sin be kind of culturally based, right? How does it kind of change depending on the culture that you're in? Well, if I'm truly living in love towards my brothers and sisters, I'm not going to be saying things that are offensive. I'm not going to be living in a way that is trying to offend them with my language or shock them with my language, right? And Paul's like, the follower of Jesus, we are lights amidst this dark world. And even if the rest of the world kind of uses language that is obscene and that wouldn't be allowed on the radio, and yet they will use it, and we think it's okay, even if they use it in their common vernacular and it comes out in conversation no matter what, he's like, followers of Jesus, you are different. You are lights And so when people talk to you, like our standards should be higher to protect and preserve out of of love. But also, do you think Jesus walked around with a potty mouth? He didn't. He didn't. But but it's becoming more common for believers to kind of go, well, you know, it's it's cultural, so we can can kind of say swears. It's not a big deal, right? Be careful, loved ones. The Apostle Paul only used one swear word in Scripture. To, to, to my knowledge, there was only one time he used a swear word. It was the, the, the Greek word skubala, right? Anybody offended here? See, no, it's cultural, right? Skubala, and, and the idea, it's like our English S word, right? And he was trying to bring this strength to his argument to kind of go like, man, everything I had before Jesus, I consider scuvala next to knowing Jesus and the blessing he is. And he's bringing a theological purity, a doctrinal cleanness and in the understanding of how ourselves before Jesus compare. And so he brings it in for emphasis, but it's not his common vernacular, loved ones. And that's what it's calling us to as well. Put away obscene talk And also lying to one another. Verse 9, do not lie to one another. Man, didn't we not live in a life of lies? The life of sin is a life of lies because it's telling ourselves lies about this world that it's better if I pursue things that are against the ways of God than if I follow God's ways. And to sin is breaking reality. It's, It's fracturing us between the spiritual reality and the physical reality and trying to live in a lie. And Paul's like, that's not who you are. It's not who you are, so put off the old life and the old ways. Let's be off with the old. Friends, if Christ is first in our lives, that's going to be your heartbeat. These things that we brought up, some of them are going to touch your heart, and, and the Spirit's going to be like, yeah, this is something. That's, that's your old life, right? Let's put that away. Let's be done with that. Let's crucify that. Now, some of you are like, how does that even happen? Let me, let me make it really simple for you. We'll do, do the ABCs, right, of, of being off with the old. A, admit it is sin, right? It's starting by just admitting it is sin. If you're hearing it today, and you're hearing the word of God, and you, something in there is part of your life from that list that we just discussed, and you're hearing going, man, that's old ways, that's sin, that's wrong. Today, to hear that and just admit, rather than going, well, this is just who I am, this is just part of my personality, and, and God accepts me. No, no, no. It's first admitting, going, this is wrong. It's sin, and it's destructive for my life, my kid's life, my family's life, all of the people in my life. It's destructive to admit that it's wrong, to admit that it's sin. The beauty is, is when we admit it, 1 John 1, 9, it's confessing our sins or saying the same thing Jesus says about our sin, to say, it's not a mistake, it wasn't a whoops, oh, I'm sorry, God, it's, it's wrong. It's sin, and that's why you came to the cross, and it's confessing that and going, Jesus, I sinned, 
And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that because when we start to take up the sin again, when we admit it and confess it, Jesus is like, that's awesome. I forgive you. And he washes us. He cleanses us from it again, right? I love it. Admit it is sin, then bring it to Jesus, right? Some of us are like, I just got to get forgiven of it and then I'll, I'll fix it, right? And, and, and that never works. You do not have the strength and the power in yourself to overcome the sinful life. So you've got to admit that it's sin, then bring it to Jesus. Come to Jesus, the only one who overcame sin, who lived a life that was perfect and sinless. He's the only one in human history to ever achieve it. He's the only person who ever will. And he provides the power, so bring it to Jesus. Open it up to Jesus. Don't quite try and hide it. He already knows it's there. So admit it to him and bring it to him and say, Jesus, this is my sin, whether it is a sexual sin in nature, whether it is a, 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 a lying sin or a thieving sin or whatever that sin is, just bring it to Jesus and admit it to him and offer it to him, put it in his hands. And then as Galatians 5, 24 talks about those who are followers of Jesus living by the Spirit, he says in verse 24, he says this, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So I love that because it's like crucify it. Kill that sin. When it's coming up and coming back, you got to bring it to Jesus. And it's almost like this. You're coming to Jesus and you got you got your sin and you're like confessing your sin. You're like, "Jesus, I need you." Oh, sorry. I'm going to need something else here. One second. You're like, "Jesus, I need you." And I could say it however it is, but I long for more and more and more. And I love money like nothing, probably more than you, Jesus. And I know it's wrong. I know it's a greedy heart, and, and I need your forgiveness. I'm admitting that to you. And, and Jesus, I can't take this out of my heart. I can't take this out of my life. So I'm just giving it to you. I'm bringing it to you today. And I'm, I'm just going to crucify it. I'm, I'm bringing it right to the cross where you were. And I'm just going to crucify that thing with you, Jesus. I'm going to just put it here. And I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to come and bring it to the cross. And friends, when you bring that to Jesus and when you crucify it before him and bring it to the cross, sometimes it's helpful for me. Just to even picture that in my mind as I'm praying. I'm just like, Jesus, I'm nailing this to the cross right with you. Or I'm remembering when you went to the cross, Scripture says you became sin on my behalf. You took on all these sins, past, present, and future, on yourself on the cross. And when you were nailed there, so were those sins crucified with you. It's a beautiful picture of putting off that old self and being done with that old self and when it creeps back up in its ways to put off. So let's all be off with the old. Let us put off the old ways and be done with it. Everybody for that? If you believe that, say off with the old. Off with the old and on with the new. Say it. On with the new, right? On with the new. Put on the new life in Christ. This is, uh, this is good. It turns uh, in verse 10. I'm going to pull back a little bit. He says, Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's ho chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony." Friends, we put on then the new life in Christ. We put on the new ways in Christ. Some of you didn't realize that when you came to Jesus, when you accepted Jesus, you put on a new coat. You had a new heart given to you, a new life. Um, but here's what happens to so many people. Before we even get to that new life and have put it on, some of us are this way. We are cloaked in the darkness of sin. We are covered. We are stained and corrupted completely to the core. 
And some of us are trying to take care of our sins. We're trying to get to heaven by simply putting on some good works and doing some good things. And we're, we're saying, if I only do enough good things, I can kind of cover it. And then we stand before Jesus and we're like, is there enough? Do I have enough good works to outweigh the bad? And the reality is no. Because when you take away the good works that have been done, you're still corrupted and broken and sinful to the core. And friends, you can never save yourself just by doing good works. You need a brand new heart. You need a brand new mind. You need a brand new operating system that only comes through Jesus. And so when you trust what Jesus did on the cross, when you put your hope in that, you are literally taking off the old person. It's dying with Christ, as we heard from Colossians earlier. That old way of living is dead. That old way of sinful flesh, sinful Adam, our great-grandfather, is done. And now you get a new self. You have a new man, a new woman, that is made in the image of Jesus. And you are given and granted through the gospel and his justifying work on the cross. He makes you righteous, gives you his righteousness, and all of the perfect righteousness of Jesus is yours. And you take on this brand new life. And some of you didn't even realize that happened. You're like, well, I, I just prayed a prayer. And I, and I trusted Jesus and gave him my heart and my life as best as I knew how. And But... I didn't know that there were some major trans... You fundamentally, from the core, were different. Some of you didn't even know it. But that's who you are in Jesus. And spiritually, you are fundamentally changed. And that's what Paul is calling us to. He says, you put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Now, some of you are not perfect. You don't... No, let's just say it. Every one of you is not perfect. All of us is not perfect. I am not perfect. None of us are. But in Christ, while we have the perfect righteousness of Christ positionally, practically in our daily lives and our decisions, we're growing more and more in line with Jesus. We're being renewed in our minds, in the knowledge of his ways, and we're living according to those, and it's transforming our lives day after day. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And there's an amazing promise about that. And an amazing truth about that. That there is no distinction and no discrimination with who gets this blessing of Christ. And how much it is reflected. He says this. Here there is not Greek and Jew. It doesn't matter your racial background. He's like, all. All. Christ is all and in all. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. And we talk about that. That may be a little odd to hear in church normally, but there's a thing and a religious rite and practice from the Old Testament that he's uh, addressing there. Barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. Man, he, he's going, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're old or if you're young or even if you're a senior. It doesn't matter if, if you are a woman or a man. It doesn't matter if you are, 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 are red or yellow or black or white or brown or what other color even if you change colors, you know, you get in the sun and you were white and now you're red as could be. It doesn't matter. Christ is all and in all without distinction. Without distinction, without discrimination whatsoever. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so he says, put on the new ways of Christ. Live according to that new life, that new identity that you have. Live according to it and put those on. He says this, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Again, remembering that identity. Now, it's important, friends, to put on this new way, right? Because if you don't put on the new way, you're creating a vacuum. And nature abhors a vacuum, friends. And not only does nature abhor a vacuum, but so does the spiritual nature and the spiritual life. For us, I mean, you remember the parable where Jesus talked about casting out of a demon and cleaning the heart? And he said, if something doesn't come in its place, that demon's coming back and it's overtaking that person again. He says, you have to replace it. And in the same way, friends, when we put off that old man and we put on the new man or put off that old self and putting on this new self, it's also putting off the old ways and putting on the new ones in their place. Because nature abhors that vacuum. So you're filling that space 
in your heart. Some of you can't get free from something because you focused on the bad all the time. And you're like, all I am is my past, and all I am is that sin. Some of you, maybe you've struggled with alcoholism in your, in your past, and you're like, you're like, I am an alcoholic. And you focus on that, and you've heard people tell you, man, you have to, you're, you're forever an alcoholic, and that's your new identity. I'll tell you, in, in Jesus Christ, that doesn't work. The Bible doesn't teach that, right? In fact, in Jesus, you have a new identity. Now, you may struggle with alcoholism. You may struggle, or it may be a major temptation, and you have to set up some fences in your life, but your fundamental reality and identity has changed. You are no longer an alcoholic. You are a child of Jesus Christ. You are a son or daughter of the king. You are a prince or a princess in the kingdom. You are a citizen of heaven and an heir of the inheritance that is coming through Christ. And the riches that are his are yours through Christ Jesus. You are God's chosen one, holy and beloved. That's who you are. And that's so vital to believe and to understand because it leads to this new character and this new way of living in Christ. He says, compassionate hearts. I love this. It's two words in Greek that mean merciful bowels. <laughs> some of you with IBS, you're like, I wish I had some merciful bowels today, right? You're like, merciful bowels or, or tender heart. And the idea for the Greeks is the bowels were the seat of the emotions, right? It wasn't like this, this you know, nebulous heart thing in the middle of your chest. It was the bowels. And they looked at it, and they're like, you are emotionally moved by one another, right? You're not a cold, stoic individual, but as followers of Jesus, you're putting on this tender-heartedness towards one another. These, these, these tender bowels towards one another, these I'm moved in spirit, that means when I see someone suffering, my heart doesn't close to them and go, I wish they would just suck it up and deal with it. Your heart empathizes and you're like, man, that must be difficult. Man, I remember when I was struggling, I remember when that was difficult and hard, right? Or your heart has the ability to connect with somebody, you know, they're, 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 they're going through a difficult trial and you're like, man, I remember that. Or sister, that was so difficult. That broke my heart as what well. You feel what they are feeling. You, not their emotions for them. That's codependency. But you identify in an empathetic way. Christians should ought to be the best at that. To have that compassionate heart. Or, or, or kindness, he says. Kindness. Now, kindness is not niceness, right? It's not the nicest person in the room and they're most like Jesus. No. Kindness is flowing out of that compassion, flowing out of love, is this active desire to help one another, to see the needs and go, man, I can meet those needs, and I want to meet those needs in Jesus, and it's assisting the needs of others in kindness. That's kindness, or humility, humility. This is great. I love how it's defined. Humility is a sober assessment of self. It is a right understanding of who you are. It is not getting too high and too lofty in your opinion and thinking more of you than you ought, but it is not getting too low and thinking too little of yourself. It is a sober assessment. And the more mature we grow, the more humble we grow, we understand how we are seen. I love how one commentator defines it. He says this, it is a deep sense of one's littleness. I love that. I love that. You could be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and yet still have a deep sense of your littleness in this world or your littleness in a company or your littleness before an eternal God who created all. He also says humility and meekness. Meekness is akin to gentleness, right? It is power under control. The best illustration I feel like is turning to like Isaiah 53 where it talks about the Messiah Jesus and how he was like a lamb led to the slaughter, right? And we don't think that Jesus was a lamb led to the slaughter because he was dumb and he was weak. Meekness is not dumb and it is not weak. Meekness is rather knowing that the lion of Judah was also the lamb of God. And that lion who could have roared at a moment and devoured his enemies chose rather to come, power under control, and submit himself to the Father's will. That's meekness. That power under control, and it's akin to gentleness. And he says also patience, patience. That's suffering long, right? Some of you had to learn patience, right? With a kid, or with a, with a friend, or with a 
a, a, a loved one or a lover, and you're like, okay, sometimes it's like suffer long, but other times it's like suffer long, right? And that's what patience feels like. It's like your longness ability is being stretched out as you are learning patience, suffering long and learning that staying power or learning to wait. When I was in uh, uh, Bible college, a freshman in Bible college at Moody Bible Institute, I ended up transferring over to Trinity later, but I was in the city living down in the loop, and, and then I was serving as a youth leader in the youth group out in Rolling Meadows. And so I would leave as soon as I could after class, but really it didn't matter when I le- left, because every time I would leave Moody and I would get on the highway, we came to a screeching halt, right? There wasn't this open tolling system back then. I mean, there was actual tolls with a real person or a machine, and you tossed your money and hoped that it didn't, like, bounce and rim out and kind of go, oh, no, I have no more quarters. What am I going to do? And everybody's honking. And all of this traffic from Chicago is bottlenecking down to these few lanes, right? A half an hour trip took two hours every single time, and sometimes it took even three and a half, four hours when there was construction. It was nuts, And I just remember just like being in it. And it was like, it was driving me crazy as a kid who was just out of high school and now first year of college. And I'm like, why, Lord? Why? I'm going to serve you. And years later, now I learned that God used that to grow my patience. Learning to suffer long, right? You mean you care about me even when I'm driving? Yes, even when you're driving. Suffering long, right? It's patience and learning it. Or he says, Christians are all about forgiveness. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And he's like, Christians, those who have give, been given the righteousness of Christ, but those who have been receiving the forgiveness of Christ, pass that on. Be setting the standard for it. Did you know there are four New Testament words for the word forgiveness that we see in English? Four different Greek words, and the most often used one is for forgiveness is releasing someone from the debt that they incurred when they sinned against you. It's letting them go free, right? They sin against you, and like Jesus did in Matthew 18 when he was evidencing God as the king and us as the servant who owned, owed thousands of talents, and the king cancels the debt. He writes it off, and in grace he, and mercy, he lets us go free, and he's like, forgive as I have forgiven you. And that's the most common usage of the word, but this is a different word. This word for forgiveness here literally has the idea of extending grace. Extending grace. So after I have canceled that debt, after I've let them go free, after I've released them and the situation and even myself to the Lord and just asked the Lord to be my judge and my jury and my justifier in the midst of it, now I'm extending grace to them. And it's the active blessing of them, returning blessing for insult, believing the best about them, hoping for the best, praying for the best. Or even if there's forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation, allowing them back into my good graces. Allowing the walls to come down, the the gates to open, and allowing friendship to be restored once again. That's forgiveness that he's talking about. And extending grace to one another. Those are the new ways of Christ. Or then he says, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And where passion was the highest virtue for the Greek, the highest virtue for the follower of Christ is love. Is love. And it's the agape love. The the love that says this is an unconditional commitment to another's good or another's best. And I'm going to give myself to making sure that you are experiencing God's best and God's good in your life. Even if sometimes it means that I take a second place because of your best and your good. Followers of Jesus who have been cloaked in the new life of Christ put on the new ways of Christ. Put on those new ways of Christ. And again, they're not just by heart trying harder. But let me give you this simple ABCs for putting on the new. First, A, ask for help. Ask Jesus for help. Remember, friends, just because you have a new 
identity in Christ doesn't mean you have all of the power at your disposal. You, this is something that we only bear fruit as we draw near to the vine. So ask Jesus for help. You can't do this alone, right? You can't be the person that Christ has called you to be. You can't live the life of Christ evidenced in these virtues just on your own. So ask for help. Secondly, believe the truth. Believe the truth about your identity. No longer am I characterized by those past sins. Yes, they still tempt me. Yes, I want, my flesh wants to go back, but God has also given me a new heart and a new desire, and it, it is chained and longs for good and longs for righteousness and longs for the things that God wants. Friends, believe that reality that you are chosen in Christ. You are beloved in Christ. You are holy in Christ. Believe those truths that you are not your past, you are not this, the sinner that you were, but you are rather an overcomer through Christ by faith. You are victorious in Christ by faith. Believe those truths. And then see, choose the good. Choose the good. So the series and the focus of the book of Colossians that we've been seeing is when Christ is first. Is Christ first? Is he first? First in your heart? First in your affections? First in your ministry or your service? First in your family? Is he first in your life? Friends, God gave us the greatest gift in his son. But it didn't just stop at the cross. It's something that works itself out in every single moment, every single day to live out the life of Christ, to know the joy of Christ as we choose the good in Christ. That comes when Jesus is first. Is he first in you? Let's pray about that right now.